All right, welcome to the Codebuster workshop for Division A. I'm Monica Bergler. I'm one of the supervisors for this event. Uh, my son Logan is the other supervisor, but he couldn't be here tonight. Um, we are going to uh, go over uh, the introduction um, of what Codebuster is, the event rules. We're going to review each of the code types. Um, you're going to reference the handout that was given to you um, when we're doing that. We're going to um, look at each one a little bit. Um, and then the rest of the handout is for you to practice. We're also going to talk about, you know, how do you coach this event uh, and some different tools that you can use to help um, prepare your teams. And then if there's any questions at the end, we'll take questions. First off, there's some definitions that are helpful to know. The kids don't need to know these by heart or anything, but if you're looking things up on the internet or reading, you know, documentation regarding ciphers, you might come across these terms and it's nice to understand what they are. So plain text is just the, you know, English language or Spanish language. It's the stuff that you can read that makes sense. Uh, a cipher text is the code. Um, so it's just kind of the gibberish uh, letters that you actually have to figure out what it means. Uh, a key is um, something, in, uh, information that you're given for particular ciphers. Um, for instance, the Visioneer cipher, you will always be given a key in order to um, decrypt that type of cipher. Um, decryption is basically what you're doing. You're taking cipher text and you're changing it to plain text with or without a key. Uh, a crib is basically some plain text letters that um, are given to you. So it's a hint uh, to help you get started. Um, a lot of times with aristocrats, uh, you will get, be given a hint just to help you, um, you know, get moving on that one. And then a decryption table, uh, is um, information that you need to work with a different cipher. Some of the decryption tables are given to you, like the Visioneer one or the Dancing Men, but others you have to be able to create yourself, um, like Pigpen and Tap Code. And we'll go over those a little bit on how to create those. So the rules. Rules are pretty straightforward for this um, event. Uh, students are tested on their ability to decode encrypted messages. You can have up to two students on a team. The only thing they need to bring are some pencils and erasers. And um, just so that the students know, they will not be able to finish this test. The test is written so that it cannot be finished. Uh, the reason for that is we want you to have um, choices in what ciphers you're going to work on. And it's also kind of a strategy thing for the teams to figure out um, on how they're going to tackle this test that they know they can't finish. Uh, and then students may answer the question in any order that they would like. When they get the tests at the invitationals and regionals, it will be in a folder and everything will be single sided and it will not be stapled together so that they can you know, um, work on it in any order they want. Um, part of the strategy with the team is figuring out, you know, how to handle all this paperwork that's going to be on their desk so that they're not wasting time, um, you know, going through it, um, you know, a lot. They need to have a, a system of, you know, when they're done with a, a problem, what do they do with it? Um, when it's a problem that they know they're not going to do, what do they do with it? Uh, but again, they, they can answer them in, in any order that they like, and it's best for each student to be working on their own cipher, but they can talk to each other if they get stuck and need help from the, their partner. Uh, high score wins in this event. Points are awarded for each correct letter in a problem. There are bonus points that are awarded for each cipher when it's 100% correct. The points that you see on the test, like in this example, it says this the Caesar cipher is worth 21 points. So if they finish the whole Caesar cipher 100%, they will get 21 points. 
if they um, they don't finish it completely, it'll be something you know less than 21 points. And um, every problem will have the point value clearly indicated. Obviously, harder ciphers will have um, more points, and the easier ciphers will have less points. So I have a question, Monica, on yes. that, that point system. So when you say that there's a bonus, if you could go back to that example you were just showing. So the bonus, I'm looking at that 21 points. So some portion of that 21 points is the is the completion bonus. And, Correct. Then, and then the rest of it is divided up equally across all the individual letters. So maybe like each, each letter is worth one point and then the rest of it is the bonus or something like that? Correct. Correct. Got it. Okay, so this year the ciphers, um, we, we added another one. So if you did it last year as the uh, trial event, um, there is one additional one uh, that you have to learn. Uh, the ciphers are Atbash, Caesar, Visioneer, Pigpen, sometimes called Masonic, Tap Code, Dancing Men, and Aristocrat. And I will go into depth on each one of these next. So we're gonna start with Atbash. This is the easiest cipher uh, to work on. Basically, it is the alphabet reversed. So the mapping is always the same. A equals Z, B equals Y, C equals X. This chart here is given to you in your resource sheets. So they don't even have to create the chart. They just have to look up each of the letters that they, uh, that they need to decode. So for example, this problem here is in your packet. It's problem number one. It shows that it's worth 65 points and it tells you that it's an Atbash cipher. So what they have to do here is the first letter here is O. So they, were, they would look at their chart, find the O and find out that the plain text letter is an L. So they would write an L in this box. Then they would do R, which is I, U is F, and V is E. So the first word here is life. And they would just continue on doing that with all the letters. So again, very simple cipher. Um, they should be able to do it pretty quickly. The chart is given to them. They don't have to, to memorize anything. Now, if they do memorize some of it, obviously it makes it um, much quicker because they don't have to reference the um, graph all the time. Um, these are really good for like, if you got some really young kids on, on your team, um, these are, are pretty simple for them uh, to be able to do and get some, build some confidence in being able to do this event. The next one that we have is the Caesar. Now the letter shift can only be between one and five characters, either forward or backwards. Um, a lot of the documentation, if you go out there, it'll say three, um, and that's the national rules. But for our region, we decided to do a five-character one because uh, three just seemed too limited, um, too easy. Um, so we, we liked having it a little bit more varied. Um, and what you're going to do to solve these is pick a short word and try the different options if you go forward or backward until you find um, a word. So for example, in this um, problem, which is problem three in your packet, I'm going to look at this word here, AQW. So on the side of my paper, I'm going to write AQW, and I'm going to write the next five letters after each of these letters and the five letters before each of these letters. And when I do that, I notice here, I get the word U. So I know that this shift is a minus two shift. So A equals Y, Q equals O, W equals U. So I can write that in. Then what I can do is take that chart that I showed you with the at bash, and I'm gonna actually write above it or below it what the shift was so that again, I can just look at this chart and figure out what the letters are. So for here, the F, I come down here, the F is a D, the Q is an O, P is an N, V is a T. So that first word is don't. And then I would continue on. So once you find the shift and you write what the shift is, 
this is kind of like an at bash and you're just filling in the letters. Now, when they're creating- know whether whether it's going to be between it could be a minus as much as minus five or it could be as much as plus five in Correct. the shift. And yes. it, so the first step is trying to figure out how much shift there is. It could be Correct. minus four, it could be plus two, it could yes. be anything in between. Got yes. it. Yeah. And when they're doing this chart on the side, the minute they find a word, they can stop. They don't have to do the whole five and the whole five. So like if I would have worked my way backwards first, the minute I would hit this U, I would have stopped. I wouldn't have continued on. Um, but I just wanted to show you how, you know, that would work if they were doing five up and five down. Um, but usually I will pick a two letter or a three letter word to figure that out. Um, and again, once once they find a word, that is probably you know the correct one. Now, if while they're create while they're doing these ciphers, the one thing they have to keep in mind is that if they start filling something in and it doesn't make sense, it's not creating a word, then something's wrong. All these things are going to be in the English language and they're going to create words. So if if a student is working on any of these ciphers and it's not creating a word then they did something wrong in the process and they need to stop and figure that out or move on to a different problem if they they can't do it they shouldn't so just in, carry on in figuring in figuring this out on, on the right hand side where you've got the arrow pointing they would write down aqw and then they would start building the rest of that table they would either either go up or down on it they, in whatever order they want, but then they would, you know, like going down seems pretty easy because A, B, C, D, E, yes, F, yeah. down, down that side, Q, R, S, T. And so that's really easy to build downward. Yes. Uh, it's a little, little less easy for my brain to go up, but obviously yeah. you could do it. Yes. And again, you could always look at that, that at bash chart to see the alphabet in order if you, if you can't work it out in your head quick enough. Um, but yeah, and they don't. You could have written that A, A through Z on the bottom of the page to begin with, because you're going to need that in the second step, right? Well, the A through Z, like I said, you could just take the resource sheet because there's yes, already yes. an A through Z there. Got it. For the app bash, and then just write your shift above it. Once um, you figure it out. Once you figure it out. So yeah. you don't have to rewrite this if you don't want to. You can just use the resource sheet. You don't have to rewrite the initial alphabet. Yes. You can just, yeah. Yeah. So, and again, That's once you right. find that shift, it's just like an at bash. Um, but I know the shift can sometimes, you know, take a little time to figure that out. But again, you're limited to the minus five or the plus five. Now, sometimes the Caesar will say, solve the Caesar with a shift of three. So it's telling you the shift. You don't have to figure it out. You just have to write the shift down. Or it might say solve the Caesar where the first letter equals D. So it's telling you F equals D. And so again, you can come down and you can create the shift a lot quicker. Um, so sometimes so it- would be a mi If that would be a minus two. Yes, so that would have been a minus two shift for that. Um, so again, they can word it differently up here. Um, they can either give you the exact shift or the first letter, or they might tell you what a word is already. Um, and you just, and then you have to figure out the shift yourself. And those are usually worth less points because you don't have to figure out the shift. The ones that you have to figure out the shift are usually worth a little bit more. Okay, the next one is a visioneer. These can seem intimidating because of the um, chart that you use, but once you know how to use the chart, they're pretty simple to do. So it's a standard substitution cipher with a key. So this one is the one that, that you're gonna be given a key to. Some of the mistakes I see uh, common with this is when they're writing the key, uh, they're skipping spaces um, when they're doing that. And I'll show you more about that in a second. Um, or they use, um, you use the key letter along with the, the ciphered letter to find the plain text. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So, or let me just show you the chart. So this is the chart they are given in their resource um, packet. 
the thing that they got to remember about this chart is this column here is the can you, key. Can you point? Can you point to that with your cursor? Um, or, do you oh, see maybe it? You are. Yeah. I don't. I don't see it on my end, but hopefully it's recording it. Okay. Because yeah. So which one, the key is that first column? Is that first column is the key? The the first row is the plain text. And then all the information in the middle here of the table is the cipher text. So what they're gonna do is they'll get a, a problem like this. Um, it's in your packet number five. And it says the following quote needs to be decoded with the visionaire cipher and the keyword is dream. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna write the word dream above the letters and they're just going to keep repeating the word dream over and over until every cipher letter has a key letter above it. Now if 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 my key was longer than this block or shorter, they would just keep repeating it. They don't skip anything. So let's say my 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 keyword was dreams with an s you know, above this Q, I would put the S and then the next one would just be D again. And I would just keep going on. So you got to make sure every cipher letter has a key letter above it. And then we use the chart to find the answer. So for this one, we take the key letter, which is D. So we come down here to the D where the first arrow is pointing. And then we're going to go over to find the cipher letter and find L, and that's where the second arrow is pointing, is the L. And when we go up, we see that the answer is gonna be I. And then we'd put an I into that. So if we look at the R, we go down to the R, we come over to find the D, and when we go up, we find M. And again, they just would continue using the chart in that way to fill out the text. So again, the, the problem I've seen with this is they skip a letter because the keyword is either shorter or longer than the, the grouping, or they get confused because they think the words are five letter words, but they're not. They're just, this one, they just group the cipher into groups of five or four, but you know, it can vary. But that doesn't mean that's how long the words are. So the word can either be shorter than this, or it could be longer and go to the next blocking. Um, I've seen so kids. The, the, oh, go ahead. The blocking on this is random in that in that case. It's just the fact that this happens to be five doesn't mean anything at all. Right? No, you could eliminate yes. those spaces in between. It would be the exact same problem. Right. Right. Because um, basically, when you create the problem, you can tell it how how much blocking you want and normally normally i try to keep it um to be the same as the keyword but um you know i've seen some in the past where you know other tests where they weren't so i, I don't want them to throw get thrown off by that but um but again the words because i've seen kids doing it where they're on the right track but they're like well that you know those five letters don't make a word um and they do they just need a couple more letters and you know and they'll stop and they won't finish it um so don't let that throw you off because if the word you know the word can expand more than five you know five letters so when you see the answer the plain text answer that comes out of it it won't be any, it'll be words that won't be five letters per word it'll it'll be a phrase and you have to figure out where the new spacing is right so, you know, where the breaks up the breaks are between the words Yes, they don't give you the breaks um, between the words in this one. It's just a random breaking. Okay, the next one is pig pen. This is the first one that you have to create the table yourself. So this table down in blue is what you have to create. Um, it might look a little crazy, but it, it actually is pretty easy. Basically, it's two tic-tac-toe squares and two X's. And the second tic-tac-toe square and the second X all have dots in, in each of the areas. And then you're going to write the alphabet starting left to right 
and top to bottom in the um, tic-tac-toe squares, you're just going to fill in the A, B, C, you know, continue on, and then go to the second tic-tac-toe square. The problem I usually see is with the X's. When you fill out the X's, you start at the top, you go to the left, to the right, and then to the bottom. And then again, to the top, the left, the right, the bottom. Okay, it's not in a circle, it's not, you know, left first or anything like that. So that's usually where I see people make mistakes creating this chart. So again, top, left, right, bottom. Once they create this chart, and they will have a piece of scrap paper in their test packet that they can create this chart on. And if there's more than one pig pen cipher, they don't have to recreate the chart. They can just use the one they created on the, the scrap piece of paper. And then you're going to look at the symbols and find the symbols and write in the letter. So with this one, the first symbol is like a less than with a dot in the middle. And if you look at this X, this is the less than with the dot in the middle, and that's the letter Y. The next one is an open um, square with a dot in it. The opening is to the right. So we look at the tic-tac-toe, the opening to the right square is an O. So we put an O, and then now we have the less than sign, and we look at this one, and it's a U. And they're just gonna continue on finding the shapes in these um, in this table and filling in the letters. Now this one, one way to make it go quicker is to start memorizing some of the shapes. Like E is the most common letter in the alphabet and that's the square. So anytime you see the square, you can just write in the E and you don't have to refer to your chart. So the more you don't have to refer to your chart, uh, the better, because you can do it quicker. But again, you, you, you can refer to the chart. But if you have a student that like really likes this one, you know, they can start memorizing what some of the shapes are um, so that they can do them a little faster. <clears throat> the next uh, cipher is the tap code. And this is another one that you have to create the chart. So basically it's a five by five grid and you're gonna start at the top left and you're gonna write the alphabet in. But you have to remember that C and K share the same spot. If you get down to the, the bottom and you don't have a block for the Z, then you know you forgot to put the C and the K together. Um, so that's the one thing with creating this chart that you have to remember that they share the same block. And then basically the code is a set of two, um, two sets of dots that you're going to figure out how what the letters are. So for example, this is um, without the lines, this is what the test is, uh, question is gonna look like. So if you look at number eight in your packet, you'll see this one. What I recommend is writing these lines in so that you can see the two groups of dots for each of your letters. If you get to the end of a line, and you don't have a group of two, you know you made a mistake somewhere in, in separating the dots. Um, the ones that I see people get confused on is when there's two single dots. Um, sometimes they think they're together, um, but you notice that there's a lot larger space than two dots that are actually together. So you gotta really look at the spacing to know what goes together. So for this one, we have two single dots. So if we go back to our chart and we look at one and one, so one in the column, one in the row, and that gives us the letter A. So we would go back and we'd write in the letter A. The next one is a three and a one. So again, we're gonna look down um, the first column to the three, and then we're gonna go over to the column one and we get an L and then they're gonna just continue on that way. And then they would just, whoops, sorry. They would just write in the letters that they find um, with their charts. Okay, the next one is Dancing Men. Now with this one, you are given the chart. You're given this uh, at the bottom, all these little dancing men. What they need to do is above um, the big line of dancing men, they have to write the alphabet. 
So it goes from A to Z across. The little group of men are numbers. I wouldn't really worry about those um, because I don't use any quotes with numbers in them. But if for some reason they, they saw um, something that used a number, these are numbered zero through nine. But again, I would just worry about the A through Z at the top. And then they're gonna look for a matching um, picture. So for this one here, uh, this little guy, let me go where I have the alphabet written. Um, so this guy is an I, the upside down guy is a T, and then this other guy with the little arms up uh, is an S. The one thing they need to um, be careful with is a lot of these are very similar in how they look. Like if you look at the J and the U, they are the same shape and everything, but you notice this little knee sticking out is on different sides of them. So those are things that they have to notice um, so they don't put the wrong letters in. But again, if they do, the word's not gonna make sense. And then they should know that they need to look um, and make sure they got the right letter for that. Okay, the last one we're gonna talk about is the aristocrat. This is the hardest one that is on the test. Um, this one they actually use in the middle school and high school, um, cause this, you can make it as easy or as hard as you want. Um, and these are um, the hardest, but I think they're the most rewarding, not only in points, but just, you know, when, you, when you're done figuring it out, you feel kind of good that you figured it out. Um, these type of problems are highly um, correlated to the frequency table of the English letters. So if you look at the bottom that um, where there is the frequency table of English letters, this is given to them. And you'll see that E is the most common letter. It shows up 12.51% of the time in English language. And then you see, you know, the T is next and the A. Um, this becomes helpful um, when you're trying to solve an aristocrat. And then you're also going to look for short and common words when solving this. So let's look at one uh, or a couple other things that you're going to look at for these is sometimes you're going to be given a hint and you want to fill those letters in that they give you and make sure you fill them all in. You don't wanna be trying to solve for a letter that you've already been given. Then you look for single letter words, which are generally A and I, or, um, or I. And what I tell my students, um, if the single letter word is at the beginning of a quote, it is usually the letter I. And if it's somewhere in the middle, it's usually the letter A. Not always, but usually those that works, and that's always a good place to start. Then again, they want to check the frequency table. They want to look for contractions. Uh, they want to look for two and three letter words. Uh, the most common words, uh, the most common three letter words are the, and, and you. And the most common two letter words are like it, is, in, of. Um, and then you wanna look for patterns. Um, a very common pattern is the word that. It has the same letters at the beginning, at the end. And so if they see a four letter word that shares the same beginning and end, a good place to start is guessing that it's the word that. Now, again, that's not always 100% true, but it's a good place to start. Then they can look for double letters like the word all or two or little. Um, also other ones are like science or people. Um, some, someone is another one that, or everything. Um, those are ones that after you see them after a while, you just kind of notice them. And then last but not least, you're just gonna guess a word. You're gonna guess some things. The worst thing you can do with an aristocrat is just sit there and stare at it. You have to start putting some things in and see how it works. Because even if you put in the wrong thing, sometimes it helps you see the right thing. And that's why an eraser is important. You're gonna have to erase sometimes doing these problems. 
But again, part of solving this is guessing and seeing what happens. So let's look at question 12 in your packet. In your packet, the question does give you a hint, but for my example, I, I'm not using the hint because I want you to see my thought process when trying to solve one of these problems that, that doesn't give you a hint at all. So the first thing I do is I usually look to see, um, I, I usually look at the frequency table. So down here, these arrows, you see that A shows up 15 times and O shows up 14 times. So I'm gonna assume one of these is an E. So the first thing I'm gonna do is look at the A and see where is it showing up. So it, it, it's showing up here at the beginning of this three letter word. It's showing up at the beginning of this four letter word and at the beginning of this, this long one. And E's don't normally start words, they usually end words. So I'm thinking that the A is not equal to E. So I'm gonna look at the O now. So the O is showing up at the end of this three letter word, at the end of this four letter word. It's, it's showing up where E's normally show up. And this three letter word ending in E, I'm guessing that this word is the, because T is the next common word. And so that works with the A. So I'm gonna guess that A is T, W is H and O is E. And then I see the single letter word. And again, going by what I said earlier, this is in the middle somewhere. So I'm gonna guess that this one is an A. And then I look down here, I see there's a three letter word. And if this is an A, then the Qs are Ls. So I'm gonna guess that one too. So then I'm gonna fill all those in. So after filling those in, this is what I have. And then I see here that I did have that four letter pattern that word that. So I know I'm on the right path. So the next things I'm gonna look at is I see this three letter word and it's starting with A. And the next common three letter word is and. And it kind of fits the layout of the, the sentence because there's a comma and then the word and uh, typically is one of the words that typically is after a comma. So I'm gonna guess that M is N, Y is D, and then I see a contraction up here. And I know contractions usually are a T or an S. Well, I already have the T. So I'm gonna guess that the D is an S and that B is I so that that word is its. And then this word down here, I look at it and I kind of look at the, the, the sentence. Um, and I'm gonna guess that this word is uh, a Y, because I look down here and V only shows up twice and Y is a one that doesn't happen too often. And the sentence, and they all seems to make sense to me. So I'm gonna guess that one too. And then I'm gonna put those letters in. So now I have a couple letters or a couple words that are missing one letter. And when I look at them, I see, this uh, something H-E-N, and I guess that the word is when, because when the something makes sense to me. This one here, I have I-N-T, and a common four letter uh, word is in two, so I'm gonna guess H is an O. And then when I look at this one, T-I something E, the word that comes to mind to me is time. So I'm gonna guess that that's an M. And then this one down here is very interesting because anytime I see a word ending in I, N, and then something else, I'm gonna guess that's a G because I, N, G is the mo one of the most common endings for words. So I'm gonna say that that one is a G. So again, I'm gonna put those letters in. And now again, I have some some words that are only missing a letter. So I have the word here, where this is obviously laughed. 
And if T is you, that finishes this word too, which is thousand. So I know that is probably correct. I come down here, I have everything but this first letter. And when I look at this, I know that this is gonna be a B for beginning. And then this one starts with an O. And so I know that this is gonna be an F, beginning of the makes sense. Or that was the beginning of the, so I know that's gonna be um, an F. So again, I put those in. And then here again, missing one uh, letter. And you can tell that that is first and that finishes up the word four. So we put that in. And now we just have three letters left or three words left that we need to, to do. And if you start reading it, you can kind of figure out what some of these are. So this is broke, this is pieces, and this is uh, skipping. And then we finish it off. Now they do not have to rewrite the quote at the bottom, but if their handwriting is really sloppy or they just, it's you know very messy, they might want to. Now I do give a benefit of a doubt. If I can sort of tell what it's uh, supposed to be, I, I give them points for that. Um, but if I can't read it or if it just, it doesn't look like anything, um, I can't give them points for it. So they want to make sure that when they're writing things um, that it is, you know, as legible as possible. Um, but again, I usually try to give the benefit of the doubt. Now, when they're trying to figure out what these letters are, I know I showed like three or four at a time and showed it, but they just want to do each one as they get it. You know, if, if they decided that A-W-O is the, you know, they want to do all the, the THs and Es and then move on to the next one. Um, the worst thing that I've seen with these is that they spend a lot of time trying to figure out a letter that they've already solved because they're not filling out this table down here. Now, I don't check this table. I don't, I don't care if they use this table, but it does help keep track of what you figured out and what you haven't. Because if you come across a letter, you can look down here to see, did I already solve that? And I just missed it when I was filling it out. Um, and also you're never gonna have, you know, two letters equaling the same letter. So O, o is E, you know, D is not gonna be E, you know, cause you've already used the E. And a letter is never equal to itself. So E will never be E. So that's the other thing to keep in mind when doing an aristocrat. So how do you, you know, get ready for this event? The key thing is to practice, practice, and practice some more. The more the kids see these ciphers, the easier they're going to get. They're gonna start seeing more things, more patterns, and they're gonna get more comfortable with the charts. Uh, if possible, put two kids on the team. And then you want to divide and conquer the test. Um, like I said, e each student should be working on their own part of the test. Now, one thing you could do is, you know, have one kid specialize in pig pen and the other one in tap code. And then they only have to worry about uh, learning how to create one um, chart. Um, I do like to make sure the kids understand all of them, but then, you know, maybe if they're one kid really loves the aristocrats, then they really focus on those. Um, but you got to figure out with your team what makes the most sense. So again, they need to learn how to create the pig pen and tap code tables. They need to get used to just trying something in the aristocrats. I know sometimes it's hard. Kids don't want to make a mistake. They don't want to have to erase things, uh, but that's part of, of solving the aristocrats. You just have to try. Um, learning some pattern words are helpful, but again, the more they practice, the more they're going to see these pattern words. And then again, you got to figure out what's best for your team. You know, do you, you go for one high point question or do you do five low point questions? Uh, or you, do you have one student you know, work on the low point ones? Do you have one student working on the high point ones? You know, it's, you got to figure out what works best for your team. Now, there are some resources out there that 
um, you can find very helpful. Um, the first is the Macomb Science Olympiad website. If you go to the Code Buster area, I do have some sample tests from last year out there. I believe there's two of them. Um, so there's test and the answer keys. So those are a great place to start, print them out, give them to your students, you know, um, have them try some things. There's a lot of videos out there that we have linked to different YouTube videos or different websites that explain how each of these ciphers work. And we also have my presentation from last year too. Another site that is very, very helpful for coaches is the Science Olympiad Code Buster sites, the Tobias.com. If you go to that website, it has help on how each cipher works, but it also um, is used for creating practice tests. Now I use this all the time. This is how I created the handout that you have tonight. You go out there, you can, you know, create one from scratch, or they actually have a test building option now where you go and you say you're creating a division A test, you want, you know, five questions, and you can tell it that you want it to be, maybe you're, you're working on pig pen, you can do all five pig pen, and then you just type in some quotes, and it figures everything else out for you. So it's really nice. Um, and and on the Macomb Science Olympiad website, I do have a link explaining how to use that site. Um, but it is very helpful. Any test that you created is saved to your device. So not everybody can see it, just you. Um, and like I said, it's great because you can create tests that are just focusing on a certain cipher. And as the kids get uh, more comfortable with them, you can start creating ones with multiple ciphers. Another helpful thing is just on YouTube. If you Google the different ciphers, um, some of them have more videos than others, uh, but you can usually find some information, some background information on them. And then there's also different websites and apps that are helpful for aristocrats. Um, the only problem I see with those is that the quotes are gonna be higher level, so the the, it might be difficult for elementary level um, students, but they are good to, to practice, um, you know, especially if you have some older kids on your team, they might be okay. The two that I have on here, I'm pretty comfortable with. I've never come across an inappropriate quote, um, but if you go to other sites or other apps, just be careful because sometimes they, they might have some that are, are not um, appropriate um, for younger kids. Um, but again, they are, they are a great um, tool. I know for my middle school and high school kids, I have them all download the app and I tell them whenever they're sitting around, they need to do uh, an aristocrat because that's, that's how you're going to get better at them. Okay, so that is all I have to um, talk about with the, each cipher. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, about anything that I said. Okay, so that's great. If you do have questions later on, um, you can go to the Macomb uh, website and um, you can submit a question um, and it'll come to me and then I can answer it um, and post it on the website for everybody to see. Um, but thank you for coming tonight and um, good luck in your events and I'll see you at your invitationals and at the regionals. Have a good night.